artificial intelligence and photography. Ooh, people are getting upset about it. Are you excited about it or do you feel like it's the end of this incredible art form? I have been over photography as uh, documentation for a while. I've always said kind of photography is dead, long live the image You can be thing. over that? I, I just feel like uh, with digital cameras and with everything that they're able to do, especially, you know, our cell phones and stuff, I don't really care if things are perfectly real. And I, for me, it's just all about the finished image and if it's compelling or not. Well, I'm sure not everyone watching this video is going to agree with that stance, but let's talk about AI a little bit more. So this video is sponsored by Skylum and their Luminar software, as well as the upcoming Luminar AI. You and I have been using Luminar for quite a while now, and it's software that's allowing you to do a lot of artificial intelligence style editing right in the program. And the idea is that it can make your editing much quicker, faster. It also does a lot of other things that some photographers might find a little bit more controversial, like changing your skies out or shrinking someone's face, making their eyes bigger, changing their body image. Mm -hmm. And in Luminar AI, the new software that we actually have a pre-release on that we've been using for the last few days, they're gonna do even more of this once that's released in, I believe, December. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure a lot of photographers out there might be like you and say, I don't really care what the software does as long as it allows me to create my artistic vision. But there's also a lot of photographers who believe that photography is a true art form that's different than you know graphic design or graphic art. Yeah, so Luminar basically just wanted us to have a discussion about AI. We can talk about other software and stuff. But to be perfectly honest, I hadn't seen anything like Luminar until using their software. and, and doing... Nothing that mainstream. I mean, there were some weird apps that would do things like this. Yes, but I for think the photography That market. might have been the first time I had seen anything like it was iPhone apps that could, you know, make your face do crazy stuff and warp your face out and stuff. But this was the first time that I saw professional software that could find somebody's face automatically and whiten teeth automatically just with a slider, or it could brighten up the eyes automatically just with a slider. And these are things that photographers are doing manually in Photoshop, but now the software can basically do it automatically. We were having a little discussion off camera about is it truly AI if the user still has to move the sliders or is the end goal to just have the computer do everything for you completely automatically? Right. I think professionals are gonna want the options, you know? But, you know, it kind of brings up the other idea that we were talking about, which is could the software, it will, but when will it get to the point where it learns the edits that you like doing and it will automatically do that to your images. Well, that's what the new Luminar AI software is going to do. Oh, really? You're gonna be able to go in and kind of build your recipe and then also have their AI technology on top so that it's gonna create a more dynamic looking image, say it's a landscape. It's gonna do all the color pops and you know contrast that AI is known for in their software, but it might start off with a more brown tone or a more sepia tone or you know okay. kind of a muted black tone that you like as your starting point. So that is, what their software is going to do, but also other companies like Adobe and, you know, and Photoshop and Lightroom. Yeah, so Photoshop just came out with a new update that has a bunch of these AI features. The itself. Sky Replacement's the big one. Have you used that yet? I have not used it, but I watched some videos on it. It looks pretty amazing. And then there's this hilarious video. We can put a clip of it in this video of this photographer messing with his face with all the sliders and stuff. And you can do crazy stuff. I mean, you can you can change the emotion of somebody's face from like angry to happy really? to surprised to upset, tired, alert. I mean, it was ridiculous. And, and when he goes like all the way, I mean, he's just a totally deadpan look on his face. And when he goes all the way, it like opens his mouth and makes teeth in his mouth and stuff. It's crazy what's going on. Which I think, I'm like you in the sense that I'm, I'm really excited about this technology. I don't think I'm at the point where I say I'm over photojournalism or like real photography. I don't want to say that either. I well, just it say, felt like that's what you said. No, no, no. For, for me and my photography, nothing that I do I feel like needs to be captured as is. Right. I, I, I care more about the artistic side of it. Definitely when it comes to news and stuff, I don't want to see fake smiles put on people's faces and stuff. Where I was going with all this was just, why do you think this is so controversial? Is it because 
People don't like to admit that these things were always done in the past and now it's in the forefront. Or is it because more people have access to it now? I mean, now that it's a simple program to use, your mom, my sister, anybody could use it. I'd love to see it on the iPhone where you could just do it with the pictures you've taken from your phone. Yeah. It seems the most useful to me. Anyone can now do this. And is that the fear? People are like, how dare you replace skies when people have been doing that forever? How dare you lighten up someone's face when wedding photographers have been doing that for their most important images that are gonna be displayed on their website or put into print? Yeah. Why do you think AI is so controversial at this very moment when many of us, many of you watching, have probably used the manual version of this throughout their entire careers. I think, like you said, just because now it's mainstream and everyone can do it now. In the past, if you wanted to replace a complex sky, especially with like a tree in the way or something, you had to be a pretty good photographer to pull that off. You had to really know Photoshop and yeah. all the panels and everything to figure it out. Whereas now, if you can just do it with a single click, it it just makes you think that everything you see online is fake. And that's becoming somewhat true. See, I still don't look at images and feel like they're fake. I'll be on Reddit and I'll see some amazing like landscape porn image. And I know exactly how it's taken, but I don't look at every image with a suspicious eye. I just look at, wow, we're able to capture these locations and these people better than ever before. I mean, there should be no place where you see more of this than at the grocery store when you look at the magazine covers. Every one of those celebrities has been retouched. And you know, you see Oprah and she's, how old is she now, 65 or so? She still looks like she's 35. I mean, she looks insane on those covers. I mean, that's or like, like Madonna. so much you retouching. You see the images of Madonna and you're like, Madonna looks old now, yeah. but somehow on a cover, she looks great. I naively just still look at those images and say, I know what's going on there, but it doesn't affect me necessarily deep down. Because I think you know what retouching is and you expect it. It is, it is normal to you. Just how, you know, going out and wearing a mask six months ago was insane. And now yeah. like, you know, if I don't have my mask on me, I'm like, oh crap, I, I can't leave the house. I, I need that to get into every single place I might want to go. Right. Um, it's just become the new normal for us. But for the average person, I don't think they know how easy it was, you know, to do basic facial retouching and stuff. And now that everyone can do it literally on their cell phones. I mean, we, we saw some stuff. I don't know what this software is called, but we were doing this uh, bikini model photo shoot thing. And these bikini models would take pictures of themselves on their cell phone and then go in these apps and like touch their stomach and it would a add ab muscles and it would shrink their hips and make their boobs bigger and stuff. And they're, they're literally just swiping with their finger. And so when you think about how easy it is now, and I'm not really on Instagram, so I don't, I don't see this every day, but you know, I'm, a, I, I'm on Reddit all the time and I see the Instagram reality yeah. where they're showing the before and after of what people are doing. And it's crazy. And I would have to imagine the majority of these Instagrammers don't know how to use Photoshop or Luminar or whatever. They're just using the free programs or cost three bucks or whatever. You still haven't watched The Social Dilemma. Have I haven't watched it yet. It makes me wonder, for the last 10 years or so, maybe the last 30 years, people have been making the argument that there's unrealistic body expectation and that it's changing the way the youth in America are perceiving themselves. Because before it used to be so difficult to do the retouching, right? but we all saw it. And so when you see Tyra Banks and you're like, wow, she's beautiful. And then you see, well, wait a minute. She didn't quite look as skinny in the unretouched image. It messes with the way that you perceive your own body. But now that we're getting to the point when anyone can do this, like you were just saying, anyone can change the way they look. Do you think that that is, I'm kind of going on a tangent here. Do you feel like that's better or worse for society now that everyone has the ability to make themselves look perfect? Whereas five or 10 years ago, you kind of had to live with the final image and be like, I have a blemish on my face and I don't hold up to the standard. But now we can, you know, a 13 year old girl can change the way she looks and maybe the pressure is less now because of the technology and the software. I was going to say, oh, of course it's way worse. And I think it is way worse because these young little kids wanna be Instagram stars and so they all feel like they have to do it even more than they did in the past. 
But on the other hand, maybe you could say it's not as bad now because everyone has the power. Right. You just watch a YouTube video and a tutorial and it shows you how to make yourself look skinny. And you just go like, oh, that's what everybody's doing. I'm going to do that too. And uh, it's still messed up. But maybe maybe that makes it a little better. On the other side of the coin here, I think you can bring it back to photographers and say, one way we had value in the past was we had the information and the knowledge and the technique to do these things. But now that's quickly being swept off the table to where anyone who can operate a mouse or swipe a tablet can make these changes that you and I used to get paid a lot of money to do. Yeah. You know, you could say, well, how is it affecting us socially and emotionally and all of that? But how is it affecting photographers? You can't just say, hey, I'm capable of taking an architectural photo and putting any sky in there and you should hire me because I, I'm great at doing that when the app can now do it and maybe realtors themselves can just take the camera out and do the same job that a professional photographer used to do not that many years ago. That is coming. That is coming. And, uh, you know, one of our buddies, a uh, photographer, videographer, he has always said, soon lighting won't even matter, you know? Yeah. Instead of taking a photograph of somebody, it's gonna take like a 3D scan of the scene. It'll look like a photograph, but then, oh, you don't like the lighting there? Just move the light here digitally, and then it'll cast digital shadows, and you could have professional studio lighting in any environment imaginable. And we're getting kind of close to that right now. I mean. I saw the new uh, Photoshop sliders. You can move the lighting direction on people's faces now. Yeah. It doesn't look great yet, but there will come a time where you won't be able to, especially when stuff is small on the internet. I mean, you, it doesn't have to be really high quality anyway. Do you have to take a flat image and then add hard light to it, or can it take a hard lit image and even manipulate that into something that's softer? I don't know. Like I said, I haven't played with it. I've just watched some videos of other people playing with it. Um, but it's very creepy and exciting. But you, as a professional photographer, you can also look at it and go, all right, like this is the beginning of something, but it's still got a long way to go before it is undetectable, you know? Yeah. I know Boris is another company that makes software. They have their optics which is the first photography suite that they've made. But they also have the Sapphire suite, which is effects that you can use in like Premiere and that sort of thing. And they're able to do that where they're manipulating lighting scenarios and flares and all of this sort of stuff to where, you know, when you see what's being done in Hollywood with green screens, I mean, that's probably the next step is yeah. bringing all of this AI and, and auto masking into the video world too. Well, I mean, think about it. It already happens on like Zoom videos, Skype videos. Yep. You can digitally cut yourself out and put yourself on a you know deserted island or whatever. And uh, it looks stupid and fake right now, but it may not be long before you can't really tell the difference. And I think that's where I get a little scared with this technology yeah. is for so many generations, the photograph was worth a thousand words. And then now the photograph can be manipulated. But luckily we still have video, right? You can't fake video. Video tells the truth. Well, not necessarily anymore there either, you know? And you've seen the deep fakes and you've yeah. seen all of this stuff where you can now transform the voice and make voices. Yeah. Say You just need a, a little bit of speech and you can get somebody to say anything. Yep. You can now have the morphing of the face actually look like the person you're trying to mimic. And it's, it's both incredibly exciting but also terrifying at the same time. If you had told me, you know, 10, 15 years ago, or asked me, which will come first? The ability to have a car that drives itself or have uh, these deep fakes where like I could put your face on Arnold Schwarzenegger's body in a movie and you can't tell that it's not real. I would say, oh, it's way easier to do self-driving cars right. than to do that. But I swear, I mean, I see deep fakes every now and again pop up on uh, YouTube. And I saw this one where people put Arnold Schwarzenegger. What's the Will Ferrell movie with the stepbrothers? Yeah. And you watch this and it looks perfect. The grain looks perfect. I mean, you would expect like, Okay, I can see the seam where it's attached to their face or like, oh, the grain on the face doesn't match the background or whatever. It looks perfect. And people are doing this stuff on little laptops at their house. That's it, the other incredible thing is how little power 
you need computing power to do a lot of this. Yeah, it details like that. And then I think there's some iPhone app now. I see people on Facebook always posting footage of their, their own faces on like uh, music videos or in little movie clips or whatever. It's like the jib jab yeah. thing that we used to yeah. have. But it looks way better. It's not like that's not perfect, but that's literally being built off people's cell phones. Yeah. And it looks really good. So the future for professional creative people is bright, but for humanity, it's very scary and dark because you can get anyone to say anything and I don't know how you're gonna be able to keep track of it. One area I wanted to talk about is reproducing the look of shallow depth of field. Because we know with the iPhone, we just released a video about the new iPhone versus the Sony A7S III camera, and people say, this is so ridiculous. How can you possibly compare these two cameras? But what we're seeing, in, especially cell phones, is the fake shallow depth of field. Yep. What Luminar AI is going to do is they have um, fake bokeh coming out. Interesting. And so you're going to be able to add the blurry effect to regular photographs too. This is only becoming more and more prevalent, right? Yeah. It's either being done with LiDAR and, and hardware or it's being done on the software side, but we're going to see more and more of this through the software. Do you think... I mean, that would be amazing. Th there's with, with fast lenses, there's kind of two elements. You have the aesthetic. It looks good because it's shallow depth of field. But you also have the functionality. It works better in low light. Yep. So do you think companies that make lenses that give you the look, more people might just be moving to cell phones and, and more simple cameras? Heck yeah. Uh, all With every feature that comes out, more people are just like, oh, I don't need to have... Yeah, I, I, I'm thinking now just other videos that we could make. People always hate when we make these iPhone versus pro camera videos. Oh, but, I thought they loved those. Yeah, but they always get the most views. People people are interested, but they're, they're just angry because they click on it because they're interested. But I would be interested to know with the new iPhone 12 Pro, for instance, what camera is it actually equivalent to from a few years ago? Right, mm. so if you bought like a- Could a, it be better than this thing? I'm sure it's better than the that. The D1H? Yeah, that It's camera, definitely got more megapixels. Yeah, I think that camera's two megapixels. I need to, we need to make a video about that camera as well. But um, yeah, like it would beat that. And I would assume it would even beat that in low light. But let's say you bought like a Canon or a Sony point and shoot camera two or three years ago for 500 bucks. Is there any way that a current cell phone is better than that? I don't know. That could be interesting. Well, because those point and shoot camera sales, I mean, they went down the toilet. Yeah. When the iPhone 2, 3 came out, yeah. that was kind of the beginning of it. But now, I don't know that there's been much uh, design and research and advances in the point and shoot camera. Does anybody still buy those? There's a few of them that uh, I think- Super zooms. That yeah, like, in the vlogging market, some people want high-end small cameras that can autofocus. So yeah. I think Canon and Sony might have like thousand dollar plus little point and shoot cameras. I would imagine those would destroy an iPhone. But what about just the standard ones that they sell at Walmart or whatever? I bet that- Yeah, the little 3X zooms that just kind of go wide and zoom in a yeah. little bit and have that mechanical lens that breaks every year <laughs> yeah. just by putting it in your pocket. There's a chance that our phones are better. I mean, there's no doubt, obviously the screen is better. Um, the screen on the phone is literally better than any camera ever made. So when you just start saying, all right, well, half of it's better. It's got a better processor than any camera ever made. Now it's just coming down to the sensor and the lens. That's probably incredibly affordable in the grand scheme of things. Soon smartphones could blow past other cameras. And if you don't have to have those large sensors to get the shallow depth of field, if there's a way to do it in post, and maybe there's some huge breakthrough in uh, low light performance with little sensors. Maybe, maybe that's a thing of the past, you know? So let's get back to artificial intelligence in the software and in photography. Do you feel like there is a value, there's certainly a value put on something that happens and it's real. If you have a real photograph and this amazing once in a lifetime thing happened, sure. The human nature is to say that's more valuable than the snowboarder that's been composited in and it didn't really happen, right? Sure. But do you think there's a point, maybe we can make parallels with like music. Is there is there a point when AI can do something as good as what a human can do or even better? I'm thinking of Mike Kelly's uh, Wake Turbulence photograph. It's definitely digital art. There's no doubt about that. 
But I could see that kind of image being completely erased and substituted for with AI. It would be so easy to tell the algorithm, hey, just like put a bunch of planes in and build this piece of artwork that, pardon me, Mike, but I think would be as good as the picture that he spent hours shooting and building. Do you think there's a point when the AI would do things better or open up more possibilities than what even the artist could do? Absolutely. Uh, that that day is certainly coming. I guess you could make the argument, though, that if uh, an artist is using it, then they could take what the software is doing and make it even better, maybe. But yeah, it's it's going to cheapen the art of photography for sure. You know, like even the Luminar software, you can add things to, you know, you could add God rays that aren't there or you could add clouds in the sky that aren't there. Not replace the sky, but just add clouds add over the moon. what's... Add a big moon. Add yeah. a planet. Yeah, exactly. And so at this point, we look at it and we're like, oh, that's cheesy and fake. But if you actually got an incredible shot of the moon behind some tree or something, you'd go, wow, what an amazing shot. But with one click, you add it in there and you go, that's that's cheesy. Kind of reminds me of the Peter Lick video. That yeah, we did. exactly. Um, so it's it's gonna it's gonna cheapen things, and maybe it kind of separates the industry even more from people who maybe maybe even more photographers will go back to shooting film just to prove that yeah. they can. But I think a lot of the art photographers that shoot film still scan their film and edit their images digitally. Right. They just like saying that they shot on film because the average consumer thinks that means it's real. What's the interesting thing in like the photography and the uh, wedding photography world, a lot of brides want that because it's more expensive and they like the idea that they receive a book of negatives. If you know, I don't know what photographers do. Some don't give raws and do give raws. Most don't give raws, but with negatives, it's like, do you give the bride the negatives and like they could own this physical thing? That's kind of cool. But you're right, if you're just scanning those negatives and then doing it digitally, it's it's kind of like people who record analog and then just put it into a digital converter and then edit in Pro Tools. The guys who really want to do it, you do it all the way, all analog, or you do it all digital. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't even know <clears throat> how many printers are left that print by shooting light through a negative. You can you can send your negatives off to a real printer, but they will scan it digitally and yeah. then print it with and it might be a light sensitive paper, but it's not shining light through the negative like they used to. So yeah. I don't know. Well, Times I'm, are a changing. I'm really excited about it because if it can save me time. Yeah. And in many ways, it also shows me possibilities that I never considered. That's what I love about so many of the film emulator softwares that we use mm -hmm. is I can click on something and it might be a cross process look or it just does something with the shadows and the highlights that I don't know how to reproduce quick enough in Photoshop to go down that route. Yeah. But it just instantly gives me that preview and I say, wow, like I never, I shot this image with a gel and I made the background go blue. But if I make it a little more green or purple, I actually like the direction of this even better than the way it was in my mind when I shot it. I think that's really exciting, and I think that's a tool where we've kind of been talking a lot about the extremes of AI, but if you pull all of this back and do some of the less controversial things, I think it's incredibly powerful and exciting for creative people because it, it allows you to go down paths quicker and in a new direction that you might not have thought of before. What about this? What about you take a photograph and then let's say you have some other photograph that you really like, maybe another photographer took it, maybe it's uh, something else that your photograph needs to match. Mm -hmm. And you could upload that to the software and say, make my photo look like this one. And I don't know if it would create multiple layers, but it could, it could do like color on one layer. You know, yeah. we're gonna match the colors, but then it appears that the person's face in this one is heavily retouched and the eyes are brightened and the teeth are whitened. We're gonna do all that and we're gonna put it on a layer. It appears that uh, this girl on this side has no flyaways, but this one's got some flyaways, so we're gonna yeah. make a new layer and cut all that out for you. And then it would give you options, but with just a single click, you would have images that matched. I mean, that would be incredible for- I think that would be the next series of yeah. software because 
it's got a, a lot of these companies like Luminar has a database that they send in their software. You don't have access to it, but it's making all of these decisions based on thousands of examples. Mm. I mean, our cameras do this too in an auto mode, right? If you take a photo of a person, the camera can tell the skin tone should be this color and the greens and the landscape should be this. It, it does things based on a series of steps from a database to help make the images look as good as they possibly can. But if you can now say, let me provide my own database, uh, Optics actually does this. They have one of their filters is you upload an image into it and it takes all the colors from that image and tries to apply it to your okay. image. It's oh. not perfect, yeah. but if you took like some kind of neon purple and orange and pink image and then apply it to your photo, it's going to use more of those colors in your image without those image those colors even being in your photograph. Interesting. So it's pretty exciting to me. I have no shame in using any of this stuff, and I feel like it's just giving us more possibilities, but it will make the professional photographer have to tweak their business model a little bit more. You can't just rely on this one specific look, especially if it's a look that can be so quickly emulated through a preset. Well, that's the thing. I mean, we've all seen trends in photography where there's a certain type of post-processing or there's a certain type of black and white conversion or there's a certain type of like depth of field and skin tone and stuff. And a lot of times you attribute it to a certain photographer. Like I can see an image and immediately know that Danny Diamond took it because he has these magenta skin tones that he really likes. Right. And uh, he's, he, he underexposes his images and then he brightens up faces and stuff manually. Joey Wright's getting like that. Joey Wright's portfolio has changed drastically in the last couple of years and he has a look now that is very different than the look he had just four or five years ago. And I think if I saw one of his images, I could, you know, among swimwear, yeah. I could say that is a Joey Wright image. Well, that's great. And that's what the best photographers in the world have. And that's why they can charge the big bucks because clients are like, I want that. Yeah. And other photographers can't replicate it exactly. But when you can replicate it with a click, that's going to be a problem for everyone because... Or maybe it just makes it more popular. I mean, Elia Lacardi, I think, has presets for Luminar. And, you know, if you could do a click, it's like... It's kind of like the Thomas Kincaid. If everyone's starting to paint in that style, but you or the Peter Hurley, everyone's copying this artist. Does it make the originator even more popular and in demand? Would Elia be a greater landscape photographer because everyone's trying to emulate his look? It's kind of an interesting conversation. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know. Elia is the first to admit that he doesn't sell many of his pictures, so. Alaya makes more money off of himself doing promotional things than his photographs do selling. So I just, I, I, I think you're right. Alaya himself might become bigger. Like more people want to, like maybe Alaya releases some uh, filter pack or something that you click and it's yeah. got Alaya stuff and everybody's like, oh, I got Alaya's filter pack. So then maybe Alaya gets more gigs because more people know who he is. But in terms of actually selling prints, I think you're going to sell less. If everyone's pictures look like that, even cell phone pictures look that good. I mean, how many images of Cinque Terre? I mean, they all look the same. Yeah. I don't know that I can distinguish an Elias image from that location because there's so many that look like it. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. But uh, for me personally, like you said, I'm just excited to have better images that are more compelling as quickly as possible. So I've been talking a lot about Luminar AI, which is not released yet, but we will have some videos on that soon on our channel. You so said you've been playing with it? I've been playing with it a little bit. I haven't seen it yet. It's a completely redesigned program. Oh, really? So it's kind of getting away from Lightroom where you have all of the thumbnails and your, your film strip and you're trying to batch and edit tons of pictures. Now it's kind of designed just to do one thing and that is make one image look as good as possible. Okay. And so because of that, it's gonna run a lot quicker. It's it's a lot faster than even the previous Luminar 4. But if you wanna get a copy of Luminar AI, you can go to the link in the description below. You can actually sign up for a pre-order so that you will be one of the first people to actually get the software when it's released in December, I believe, of this year. And if you're interested in taking your photography to the next level, head over to fstoppers.com slash store. You can learn from a ton of the best photographers in the world or head over to fstoppers.com for daily free content.